Good afternoon to you all. I see that the weather was quite fair with us. We were worried about it. And I'm happy to see so many people here. A few years ago, some of my friends who wrote books on Israel and others who planned writing about Israel told me, and it was one after the other, that they spoke to publishers and the publisher said, forget about it. Israel is not an inter interest interesting topic anymore. No one will read your book. Don't publish it. Well, we have a wonderful example of how wrong they were. If you write a good book, and the book that we are going to discuss today is an excellent book, very many people will read your, your book. If I'm not mistaken, since 1971, when Amos Elon wrote the famous book, The Israelis, we didn't have such a wave of interest, curiosity, uh, uh, as we had uh, in the last uh, two months, vis-a-vis -vis the new book that uh, was published by Ari Shavit. The book is written in a very interesting style. It's a travel log. And it reminded me that one of the first books or travel logs that were published on Israel in the modern times was done by an American by Mark Twain, who was a very young journalist, 31 years old, and he went to Israel in the first organized tourist tour. It wasn't called Israel then, it was Palestine, but he went to, to the land of Israel, or to Palestine, and wrote his book. And so that was the first uh, uh, travelogue, and this is the, the style of the, of the book that we are discussing. There was another travelogue which was very interesting and got a huge reaction, both in Israel and the United States. That was published in 1993 by Amos Oz, called in Hebrew, Povesham Be'eretz Israel, in English only uh, the land of Israel. So uh, Ari Shavit's book is uh, similar to these travelogues, but it's very much different. A, it covers a huge period of history. He travels in time since the beginning, since his grand-grandfather came to Israel again to Palestine in 1897, and he finishes with today's <coughs> events. Secondly, it's not only a travel in time, it's also a travel in space, and each chapter describes a different aspect of Israel from a different, different geographical era. So, so that, that adds to the depth and the width of, of, uh, of the book. Ari Shavit was born in uh, Rehovot, not in 67. When he, 67, he was already 10 years old. 67 was the reason for Amos Oz to write his book. Uh, and he, when he wrote his book, he, dis, he, he discussed the second generation of Israelis. So Ari was too young for that. 
the people, uh, um, Amos Oz described, were the, the people of the second generation, those who took over Israel, the, the leadership of Israel after the Six Day War, the Rabins and Dayans and Sharons and Paris, etc. He was born uh, in, in, in Rehovot, studied in Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In 1980s, he joined uh, for a short period of time a very interesting journal that was, that was uh, published then. The, 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 the lifetime of the journal was very short, called Koteret Rashid, headlines, which had uh, some of the best Israeli writers. And later on in the 90s, he moved to uh, public affairs. He was one of the leaders of Peace Now. I hope you remember that, Ari. <laughs> and, uh, and he was the chair of the ECRI, Association for Civil Rights in Israel. Later on, in 1995, he joined Haaretz. And since then, he writes for Haaretz. In the last decade, he, the print media was not enough for him, and rightly so. So he moved to television as well. The book shows, really, the two major aspects of his career. A journalist, you have a lot of interesting stories, scoops, fascinating uh, facts, and a real writer, an excellent writer. And the language is beautiful, and the descriptions are fantastic. So it, it's really, it, it's fun to read it. And if I may, let me add one thing more and give more time to our guest today. And that is that the uniqueness of of the book, according to me, I'm ready to hear your opinion about that, is twofold. One, Ari is the first Israeli who presents to the Americans the issue of 1948. We are discussing here the problem of 67, territories for peace, the occupation, the Palestinians. He deals with 48, the issues of 48, which, by the way, have been dealt in Israel for several years but didn't reach here. Here is a taboo to talk about 48. If you mention anything that happened in 48, wow, that's awful. He does it. But he does it, and that's the second point, he does it, he does it from a real love to Israel, from a serious, de deep enthusiasm and support of the Zionist enterprise. And though he criticizes the Zionist movement, and the state of Israel, or the governments of Israel, for mishaps, wrongdoings, etc., it is done from strong commitment to, to, the, to, the, to the process, to the land, to the people, to the state, and to, and to the Zionist movement. And that is something that many American Jews do not understand. If you criticize Israel, it means that you are anti-Israel. Maybe you are even anti-Semite. If you support anything that the state of Israel does, that shows that you are a good Zionist. And in Israel, the public, di public discourse is different. You can be an ardent lover of Israel and criticize. So this is what Ari Shavit did, I think, in his book. And he did it in a wonderful way. And uh, therefore, I guess, that, that's one of the major reasons why his book became so popular and so uh, interesting to so many people in the United States. So without further ado, Ari, the floor is yours. He will talk for 20 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Well, um, first of all, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I'm really uh, uh, surprised and, and very happy to see so many of you here. Uh, I hope uh, we will not disappoint you in the next uh, 80 or 90 minutes. Um, actually, after being compared to Mark Twain, Amos Elon, and Amos Oz, I should just leave. I mean, let's <laughs> leave it. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, <clears throat> but as I, I did promise to, to talk a bit, I will. I'm really, really much more into conversation. I mean, I would love to hear your questions, your remarks, uh, any, any tomatoes you want to throw at me, anything. Uh, but I really believe in dialogue, and, and, and I think that one of the things we need regarding Israel is direct, sincere, uh, hopefully intelligent and deep conversations. So this is actually what I hope we will do in a few minutes' time. But as the tradition is that uh, one has to open with some, some, uh, some words of his own, I will 
do my best briefly, hopefully, to say a few words about why I wrote the book, how I see the book, and to connect it a bit with, with the Israeli condition and the Israeli challenges and the Jewish challenges of, of the day as I see them. So I, I begin by saying just what Yoram was talked about, and I'm really, um, I, I went through this experience he described. When I uh, started, when I was, I had the idea, I actually had the dream or the wish to write this book for probably over 20 years. Uh, but uh, the opportunity came about actually after I wrote a piece about Sharon. It's quite ironic with the timing now, uh, when Sharon collapsed in 2006, and my article was published about him, was published in The New Yorker, and then the doors of Manhattan publishing opened, and I had the opportunity actually, you know, to fulfill my old dream. But when I came, you know, home and I discussed it, many, many people said to me just what Joram told you, that he or others were told. I mean, people say, why there's so many Israel books? Uh, why write another one? Especially as there is such deep Israel fatigue. No one is interested anymore. It has all been said. What can you do that will be new? Uh, forget about it. It's a bad idea. Write about something else. Uh, <clears throat> and I rejected that advice because of two reasons. One was a personal one. Ever since I remember myself as a young adult in Israel, I felt that I was born into a unique nation, that I was born in a unique land, I was born into a uh, unique historical event and drama. <clears throat> and I felt for myself that I had a need to decipher it. I felt that I have to understand what this happening is all about. So there was an existential need for me, not in the kind of existential <coughs> threats and existential strategic issues, but existential in the Salter sense of the word, to, to do this to go through this journey, to travel in my own land, and to try to understand what this is all about. So that was the personal motivation. But as people kept asking me this question, why, why write another Israel book? I looked at the shelf. It was not all Kindle then. And I've noticed that there are so many good Israel books, some of them really brilliant books. But most of them are either history books, political books, polemics, a lot of polemics. But I didn't see there a book that really tries to deal with the overall Israel story in a personal way. And just as Yoram said, the book that was there was Amos Elon, the Israelis, but that was written over 40 years ago. And in a sense, there was Amos Oz's book, but even that was written 30 years ago. And the book people were reading, and I still recommend reading it because I think it's a great book, is the book written by my dear friend, Tom Friedman. But Tom is now Israeli. His book too, by the way, was written 25 years ago. And he's not an Israeli. He didn't deal with this as an Israeli insider who deals with these issues. So as I looked at this shelf, I said, one, something is really missing here. But I said something else. I said, this is no coincidence. The fact that there isn't such a book is because we've lost our narrative. And this is deeply saddening and troubling in the case of Israel, because we were a narrative before we were a nation. Judaism, to begin with, comes from the book. But Zionism, too, was a story before it was an entity. We had a strong sense of our saga, our mission, 
our meaning, our searching, where we are coming from and where we want to go, we, all, we had all that in a very intensive way before there was anything there. Before there was anything there. And ironically, the stronger Israel became physically, the more economic power, political power, military power it had, the narrative, the narrative which is so essential for us, the narrative which enabled us to be, evaporated. In my mind, there were two or three major reasons for this disintegration of the Israeli narrative. The first one is the 1967 war, or the seventh day following the Six Day War. The moment we occupied the Palestinian territories, or whatever you want to call them, our agreed upon united and uniting narrative split into at least two. The old Israel story was the story that is described by my elder dear friend, the poet Chaim Guri, as the ethos of the besieged and the just. That was what Israel was about for Israelis and for non-Israelis. But the day following the Six-Day War, that was not the case again. And from year to year, that became worse. Because the debate over the territories, over occupation, over peace, call it what you may, split us. And it, 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 it made it impossible for us to hold one integrative narrative. That was, in my mind, problem number one. The second problem is a problem usually not talked about. Usually, when people talk about Israel's problems, they talk about Israeli extremism. And we have a serious problem with Israeli extremism, whether it's nationalistic extremism or religious extremism. But in my mind, we have another problem which is not usually talked about. And that problem is cynicism. If there is something that I wish Israelis would learn from Americans, is to be less cynical. In the last decades, our public debate, our, the way we run our affairs is the acid of cynicism is like killing us from within in many ways. I think I have an explanation for that, and that has to do with the third reason. What happened is that in the first 50, 60, 70 years of the Zionist movement, we kept telling the story to ourselves in such an intensive way we kept saying to ourselves how just we are, how pure we are, how wonderful we are, how handsome we are, how blonde we are, <laughs> what amazing farmers we became. That at a certain point, we were fed up with all that. And the certain point in my mind was 73. If 1967 split us into different narratives, 1973 and then 1977, which was the political change in Israel that actually was a result of that. It was not only the end of Israel's ancien regime, the old labor leadership and structure and civilization that actually led the Zionist movement for half a century, but it brought about an attitude. We moved in a very typical Israeli way from one extreme to the other. From being too obedient, we became too judgmental. From being too committed, we became too critical. The entire, the spirit of, again, the politics and the public life, I'm not talking about personal life, has changed dramatically. And this new kind of cynicism and criticism really prevented us from seeing some of the wondrous things and features of Israeli existence. So in my mind, these were the problems, and that was the challenge that I had to try to deal with in a, my own way, and again, with no, no objective ambitions. I, I, I wrote this to begin with for myself, for my dear ones. I did not anticipate the reaction it had, but that was the mission I took about myself. So what did I try to do? My first mission was try to bring it all back to the human level. 
at the end of the day, what's so striking about Israel that it's such a unique, unique human phenomenon. Zionism is an amazing human endeavor, for better and for worse. And my wish was to bring back the feeling, the, 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 the intimate and emotional relationship with this human drama. So my book is in many ways about history, but it's not a history book. It's relevant to politics, but it's not a political book. I go and listen to the life stories of people, of real people, and I do it with all my heart. As I like to say, you know, I make many mistakes, but I make them with all my heart. <laughs> and I, it's this human search, a human journey, lis listening to real humans telling the stories of their human stories that is, in my mind, the essence of the book. And one of the better or more more, more moving compliments that I got was that this is nonfiction that is, has almost the quality of fiction or, or as a kind of literary, almost poet, poetic uh, quality at times. And, and this was my, my wish because I wanted us, and I'm a political person and I have very strong opinions, but they did not want, this was not about my ideas, my ideology, how I think everything should be solved. And of course, I know how everything should be solved, <laughs> but this was not it. It has insights, it has ideas, but that was not the mission. The mission was really to bring, to enable us to open our hearts and eyes to look at, at what's really happening. And I think that beyond that really, or, or while doing that, my mission was to try to look at the big picture because Israel is so tiring. There's so much events, all these daily events, all this news, much of it bad news the friction, the constant, you know, I, I've realized that so many American Jews and so many Amer non-Jewish Americans that care about Israel, you know, take the New York Times every day into their hand or into the computer and they have this love-hate relationship with this thing that drives them crazy. You know, they care so much and yet the news is so bad and people are so confused about that. But this is all the details which are important and we should cover that. But my attempt was to put it in the larger context, to look at the big picture, at the saga that Israel is. So what did I do? If, assuming three or four of you have not read the book yet. <clears throat> I've asked myself three questions that are, in my mind, the more important questions, Israel questions. And the questions were, why Israel, what's Israel, and will Israel? It was not easy to ask these questions, but I thought these are the questions to be asked. But I did not try to answer these questions with thesis, with arguments. I tried to answer it, to answer them by telling the story, as I see it. <clears throat> As it's a personal book, of course, I had to begin with my own beginning. So I began with the arrival of my great-grandfather, Herbert Bentridge, in the port of Jaffa in April 1897. My great-grandfather was a very untypical Jew for that time. In, a, in many ways, he was 100 years ahead of his time because he enjoyed in London of the late 19th century many of the privileges that so many American Jews enjoy today. He was one of the very few, a small percentage of the Jewish people in Europe, definitely. In this country, there were already quite a number of successful Jews. But in Europe of 1890s, there weren't that many Jews that who were emancipated, wealthy, successful, and had it all. And he had it all. He was a self-made lawyer. He made a small fortune by being a copyright lawyer. He had a beautiful building home in the center of North London. By the way, his home is today the mansion of the Israeli ambassador in London. He had a country home by the sea in, on the beach of Kent. He loved Shakespeare. 
He had his vacations in Cornwall and the Lake District. Except for the fact he was Jewish, he was as British as British can be. He was a real Victorian gentleman. Romantic, dominant, not very pleasant, but very impressive. <laughs> so I asked myself, why would such a Victorian gentleman who has it all, why would he go to remote, desolate wasteland that Palestine was at the time? Why would he travel from the world's capital to one of the most neglected, problematic provinces of the declining Ottoman Empire? And I came up with two answers. And the answers are not relevant only to him, but to his peers, the founding Zionists. These people, the founders of Zionists, my great-grandfather belonged to a group that was Zionist even a moment before Herzl, but then they were very close to Herzl. The first insight that these brilliant people had was that modern Europe is becoming a death trap to European Jewry. They realized that the new anti-Semitism that was race-based and nationalism-based was going to be even more dangerous than the old religion-based anti-Semitism. So they did not know that the 20th century would produce such places as Auschwitz and Treblinka. They couldn't imagine there will be such evil inventions as gas chambers. They could not foresee Hitler. But they realized that the Jews who lived in Europe with all the problems for such a long time had no future in Europe. Many of them envisioned some sort of mega pogroms or a series of pogroms. Others just thought there is no future for the Jews, definitely the Jews of Eastern Europe. So their endeavor, their endeavor was in my mind one of the most remarkable human endeavors. I'm not saying it only as a Jew, as an Israeli, and as a Zionist, which I am, and proud of. But in purely human, universal terms, when you look at the Zionist revolution, you realize it's one of the most dramatic and impressive revolutions one can imagine. Because these people saw they were facing the most radical threat and they answered this threat with the most radical act one can imagine. They transferred the people from a continent to a continent. They took a land. They built a nation. They revived the language. And they did all this in order to save their people. So Zionism, unlike other liberation movements, did not only, was not only there to give political rights and freedoms to the people, it was not only about social and economic rights. It was about actually the physical act of saving a people. And when I hear so much Zionist bashing in the recent years, I really am outraged. Because at the end of the day, this was not a colonialist movement, but exactly the opposite. These were the people that were the ultimate victims of Europe who realized that Europe is going to kill or destroy the Jewish people, and they took, took whatever action needed and used European power in order to save themselves, to create a safe heaven that will save these people from European evil. It's exactly the contrary of what is many times said about Zionism. And the, when you look at what these people did, the insight they had, the imagination they had, the determination they had, the ability to act in a hostile world in order to save their people, it's striking. So the one real sin of Zionism is that it was too late. That's the real sin. If all this would have begun 20, 30 years earlier, if we would have had the Jewish state in the 1920s, Millions and millions of European Jews would have been saved. Probably not all of them, but many of them. That's the real sin. But my great-grandfather and his peers had another insight. 
they realized that once the pogroms will be over and the Cossacks will be gone, and anti-Semitism in its vulgar, violent ways will be suspended, the Jewish people will face another threat, which is exactly the opposite. Because the old Jewish formula that enabled us to live in the diaspora for nearly 2,000 years, 1,500 years, was based on what I call the two great Gs, the intimate relationship with God which gave meaning to all the suffering we went through. And let us not forget how much suffering there was long before the Holocaust. But on the other hand, it was the walls of the ghetto that defended our existence. But these two Gs were changing and disappearing. And what happened is that the modern era in Western Europe and in North America, in countries that were so good to Jews, where emancipation was possible, where liberties were given, when there were opportunity and equality, when Jews began having it as good as they ever had it, there was the new danger of how to maintain non-ultra-Orthodox Jewish civilization. Because the ultra-Orthodox Jews do not have a problem. They'll be here in 100 years' time and in 1,000 years' time. They can live in their ghetto with their formula in Brooklyn or Antwerp or anywhere else. But it's the non-ultra-Orthodox Jews who are faced with a real identity challenge. Because these open societies and this new comfortable diaspora life jeopardizes their collective existence in many ways. So if non-ultra-Orthodox Jewish civilization is to be maintained, it needs a Jewish national home that will be a powerhouse for Jewish identity that is secular and progressive and liberal and democratic. Ironically, it's these Jews who need Israel much more than the ultra-Orthodox, who actually do not need it existentially. So while on the one hand, the early Zionists were brilliant in the fact that in the 1890s they tried to preempt the 1940s, without knowing exactly what will be there. They were also brilliant in the sense that in the 1890s, they tried to preempt the Pew Report. They saw then the challenge that today the American Jewish community is faced because of all the grace and the riches and the good life and the liberties and the openness of the society that which in, which, within which they live. So these were the two brilliant ideas which in my mind, or insights, which in my mind not only justify Zionism, but make it one of the most just and needed and fascinating movements that we've seen in modern times. But when my great-grandfather arrived in the port of Jaffa, there was something he did not see. What he did not see is that the city of Jaffa was predominantly an Arab city. What he did not see is that the city of Ramle is an Arab city. What he did not see is that the city of Lida is an Arab city. And he did not see the dozens and dozens of Palestinian villages along the road to Jerusalem I did not see the dozens and dozens of Palestinian villages he passed by on the way from Jerusalem to the Lake of Galilee. Now again, let us not be unfair. At that time, there was not a mature political identity of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people did not define themselves yet as a people. There was no Palestinian nation as such. There was no Palestinian republic, no Palestinian kingdom. The early Zionists were not some sort of conquistadors who conquered a land that was politically established as an, an independent nation. What you had in the Middle East is a kind of chaos, something we are going back to now, kind of tribal chaos under the Ottoman Empire. 
And yet, although I put and I give several arguments in the defense of my great-grandfather and his peers, the fact remains that they did not see that there were half a million Arabs living in that land. And this is the basis of the story. These are the seeds of the drama. On the one hand, you have the beginning of this astonishing triumph, the brilliant ideas, the insight, the heroism, all these amazing traits that may, enabled Israel to be. But on the other side, you have the tragic flaw that created this 100-year-long conflict that did not end to this day, and I do not yet know when it will end. And here are the beginning of the triumph and the beginning of the tragedy. I will not bore you with all the different places I visit and the different eras I visit as I travel through my country's history and present, the land, space, and time. We'll probably talk later when you ask me questions about LIDA and about the 50s and about other things. But I want to move fast forward to the last chapter. What I do in the last chapter is I go in the footsteps of my great-grandfather and look at my nation in a sense through his eyes or through his, that perspective. And I ask myself, where have we succeeded and where have we failed? What was achieved and what was not achieved? In general terms, I come up again with two sides of this amazing story. On the one hand, in my mind, Israel is the most endangered nation on the face of the earth. Definitely is the most endangered OECD country or Western country, but in many ways, it's the most threatened nation. Why? Because there is an inherent tension between the fact that this is a Jewish state and many, many of the hundreds and millions, if not more, of Muslims surrounding it. Many Muslim nations are friendly to us. Many, many Muslims are friendly to us. One should not generalize. But there is a tension caused mainly by the fact that the land that is our land is also the holy land that is sacred to the three monotheistic religions, and that creates an inherent tension by the fact that we occupy it or control. The second tension is between the Jewish nation state and the Arab world. That's an inherent tension. Now today, many of our neighbors, definitely the Sunni moderate nations, are actually quite friendly to us. Some, with some we have peace. With some that we don't have peace, we actually have a very intimate relationship. They say that our, our leaders or diplomats meet with theirs in all kinds of hotel rooms complaining about the city that is not far from here. <laughs> and yet, and yet, don't, let's not ignore the fact that the tension is there. 13 years ago, 13 and a half years ago, I interviewed Professor Edward Said, with whom I had some dif disagreements, and he had some disagreements with me. But at the end of this long and fascinating and intimate interview, Said said to me, you know, Ari, I worry about you, about you Jews. Because at the end of the day, you Jews are a minority in the Middle East. And the Middle East, is merciless with its minorities. It's not very good with minorities. He didn't say it, but I can add, go ask the Kurds, go ask the Copts, go ask the Christians in Lebanon. This is not only a Jewish or Zionist issue. There is lack of tolerance in that region between Arabs, but definitely with non, the, the willingness to accept a non-Arab sovereign nation within the Arab world is still questionable. But the third, and in many ways the deepest and the most bitter element, is the conflict between 
with the Palestinians. I'm an anti-occupation person. I oppose settlement. But let us not deceive ourselves. The conflict is not only about occupation. The conflict is not only about settlements. The conflict is a deep, deep conflict that has religious dimensions, social dimensions, historical dimensions, identity dimensions. The conflict is a conflict about much of the land and not only about the West Bank and its checkpoints. So these are the three threats that are there. So even when Israel is very strong, they are always there. And the Israelis, and let us remember this, let us remember this, Israelis are fundamentally intimidated. You have many problems in this country. Your health care is not that great. <laughs> Washington doesn't work always as, as it should. Many problems. There isn't one American in this room who has doubt whether America will be here in 100 years' time. No Israeli can be sure that Israel will be there in 100 years' time. Most Israelis, unlike me, do not express this. This is not something talked about. But this is the case, and people know. And this creates a unique Israeli condition, which is a human condition that is different, different than most nations in the world and most people in the world. But this is where I move to the bright side. The bright side is that although we live on the edge, although we are in danger, when we are challenged, we have turned life on the edge into a source of power and vitality. So Zionism failed in creating the utopia it wanted to build. The kibbutz dream is shattered. There will not be a socialist paradise in that land. We will not be a perfect social justice society. But what Zionism did succeed in creating is the most amazing, robust, free society one can imagine. We are creative, and we are innovative, and we are sensual, and we are sexy. <laughs> we make more babies than any other OECD country. Think how telling this is. Think of your personal life. Think what does that mean, the fact that our demographics are dramatically different than any other modernized industrial nation. And that reflects something. Because at the end of the day, there is something incredible about our being. Because at the end of the day, what you have in the Jewish-Israeli saga is the story of a people who came from death and are in many ways threatened by death, but have chosen life and are celebrating life. And if there is a chapter I like more than any other in this book, it's a chapter about the 1950s, not the chapter talked about so much about Lida, which I will answer questions about later. Because what you see, even if there is people ask me, what did I learn in my journey? I was shocked to discover how amazing the 50s were. Why? Because we all know about Israeli military heroism. But believe me, there was military heroism in other nations. The Russians in Stalingrad were probably more heroic than all the Israeli soldiers in all the wars together. I admire and have deep feelings about our pioneers. But we had pioneers in this country and in other countries as well. But when you look at the 1950s, you see a human achievement that is, you can, that is totally unique. Imagine America today going through a war where it loses three and a half million people. God forbid. Imagine three and a half million Americans dying in war. And then imagine that in the next three and a half years, America absorbs 500 million immigrants. That's not humanly possible. That's not humanly comprehensible. And yet Israel did that. So it's not only because we had leadership at that time, unlike today. It's not only because all the right decisions were taken, building villages first, and then housing, and then industrializing the country. 
going and settling, going to this difficult thing of having a deal with the Germans so we can build for our future and other things that were done in the right way. But the heart of it was the people. Because who were these new immigrants? So many of them were human wrecks. So many of them had nightmares at night. So many of them had numbers tattooed into their arms. And yet these people who've experienced the most terrible trauma did not become addicted to their past. They did not become suicide bombers. They did not go into a culture of hate. Their revenge was to go for the constructive. They sent their kids to schools. They built a health care system. They built housing. They built a nation. And this is, in my mind, the great spirit of Israel. That's the potential of Israel. And if I'm angry at our politics of the last 30 years, is that we abused so much of that. I think many Israelis still have in them that sort of spirit in their individual life, in the way they do business, in the way they do arts. But as a political body, we lost that spirit. But I believe it can be regained. But when you look at Israel, at the bottom line, this is what you see. You see many flaws, many problems. You see this terrible mistake of occupation and settlements. And yet you see an amazing endeavor of humans who experienced catastrophe but will not become victims of their past, but chose to prevail over it. And at the end of the day, this is what I'm so proud of. So while we should all criticize what's wrong with Israel, and why we should be fair and honest about discussing Israeli wrongdoings, we should also look at this astonishing human triumph. Because in many ways, Israel is the victory of the human spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. As I thought, it would be wonderful, and it was. Uh, I was tempted to interview you, but I, I decided not to do that and let the people ask questions. But I do want to have one comment and one question before I give the floor to the others. That's the beginning. <laughs> no, 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 only that. First of all, I'm sure that all of you are, no, are now going to buy the book voluntarily. My class, some of them are sitting here, are going to have to read it non-voluntarily. <laughs> for many reasons, one of which is just a short piece in chapter 14 which describes reality shock in the year 2006. I haven't seen such a wonderful, concise description of what happened in Israel in the last 20 years. In less than 30 years, Israel has experienced seven different internal revolts. The Settlers Revolt, the Peace Revolt, the Liberal Judicial Revolt, the Oriental Revolt, the Ultra-Orthodox Revolt, the Hedonistic Individualistic Revolt, and the Palestinian-Israeli Revolt. In a sense, each and every one of these upheavals was justified. They thought justice for an oppressed minority and addressed latent but vital needs. They all brought to the center stage forces that were previously willingful, willfully ignored or marginalized. But the outcome of these seven revolts was the disintegration of Israel's republic, et cetera, et cetera. A wonderful description, and it has to be put in any curriculum on Israel study, in Israel studies. So be prepared to read this, this chapter, if not the entire book. But I want to ask you a difficult question. Forgive me, we are friends for many years, so I can allow myself. You said in the, your beginning, uh, the, the first sentences, that Israel has lost, or we have lost our narrative. Indeed, it's, this short piece explains how and why. And you wonderfully describe not the diminishing, but the declining previous narrative. So the, so the diagnosis is fair. But is, I, I read all the, all, not all, but many of, of the, of the uh, reviews of your book, and, and some of them say, yes, but where is the prognosis? What should be done? What's your plan? What is the new narrative? 
besides the, the settlements and the occupation? What else? What should be our, our future narrative? Do we have an answer? It's the next book. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's, I'm only half joking. Uh, look, this was a decision I made. I mean, I, I saw this one coming, not, uh, even before I knew I'd be coming to Maryland. And actually, I mean, in this sense, I'll, uh, I'll share with you something relevant about the, another book. I mean, when I worked in Kotel Toshi uh, many years ago, David Rossman wrote his Yellow Wind, which is an incredible book about occupation. And I hope I'm not uh, disclosing a secret, but no one will tell, right? So that in the original version, he had in the last chapter, you know, his peace plan, you know, Palestinian state. And our wise editors, Nahum Barnett and Tom Seger, the Kotel Toshi, told him, you know, leave that. We, we, this is not your fort. We, we don't need that. Leave the people with the sense of the problem, the terrible problem. So for me, it was so clear that I'm, I'm, I, my wish, except for the fact that I hope Israel people would, would have a fresh look at Israel and like restart the, the dialogue and conversation about it, something which partially happened. <coughs> My wish is that any one of us, you know, will close the book and ask himself, what should be done? And I definitely am asking myself that question. And I have all kinds of ideas of, of, of you know, writing stuff, doing things that will deal with your question. I think it has, I think your question is absolutely right, but I think it would have been wrong to put it at, at the end of this book because it should be left as it is, as, as this drama, you know, one, one of the beautiful sentences said about this book in, in the New York Times Review was that it reads like both a love story and a thriller. And I think the thriller is because you wonder is there a happy end or a sad end. This is, and, and almost every page moves between this kind of pessimism and optimism. And I think it remains for us, the duty is on us to, to guarantee a happy end. And, uh, but that's really the mission, you know, following the book, I don't think it was the book's mission. So we promise you to bring you back to the campus to talk about the new book. All right, okay. question, please. please. Please introduce yourself when you, when, and you. Look, first, I, I think, again, and, and if I have to put it in a, almost a soundbite, in a sentence, I think that the essence is to remind ourselves that Israel, what Israel should be, must be, is a just, safe home for homeless people, respecting the rights of the non-Jews living in it as totally equal and free within that home. This is, I think that the sense of home is what I would build a new Israeli narrative on for the future. I think this is something that we lost with all these debates and we should bring it back. Now, to deal with some of the issues raised also in what, in your, your the paragraph you quoted, I think that what happened is that basically until 73 and 77, there was, I think, I'm a great admirer of labor Zionism. I think they enabled us to be, with respect to the other movements as well, each one contributed in its own way, but at the end of the day, the, the, the most impressive uh, movement was labor Zionism. Now, there was no way that labor Zionism could have remained in power forever, and it had to be replaced. The problem in my mind that no real power, alternative power, took responsibility in the same way that 
the old guard had responsibility for the fate of the nation to deal with the overall Israeli condition. In many ways, since, since the 70s, we are all in opposition. We are all minorities fighting each other, bitter about each other, and, I, and there isn't what I call you know, kind of serving elite that unites the country with all the differences. And again, the problem with the old regime was that it was very oppressive to individuals and to minorities. And, and in this sense, it was very important, and there is a lot of good news, because the, you, you needed to give much more liberty and space to the Arabs, to the ultra-Orthodox, later came the Russians, to the, to the gays, to the, all, all these things were needed very much in order to have a liberal, vibrant society that, that is a free society. So this is actually something very positive that happened. The problem is that we did not create a kind of new social deal, a new social contract to, 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 to unite the different tribes that Israel is made of today and have mechanisms that enable us to respect the different identities, giving space, but have some sort of reasonable uh, 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 political mechanism that, that, that both unites us and, and both defines what, what does unify us and, and sets the rules of how do we make reasonable decisions regarding what we disagree about. This is what, in my mind, is missing. So I would look for, for this kind of new, you know, a kind of, of new covenant uh, between respecting the fact that now we are tribes. I actually think that many of the tribes have much more in common than meets the eye. In this thing, I think Israel is more of a success than people think. And, but, but we need to, to formalize this politically. And, and, and you know, in a sentence, I think that Israelis are great and the politics is disastrous. So, so, so if we could bring back some of the, the talent and energy and initiative and, and dynamism that you see in every field of Israeli life, if we can bring it back into our politics while creating this kind of unifying pluralism, I think that's, that's where the answer lies. Thank you. Yes, please. Please identify yourselves. So, I'm Tom Walston, uh, emeritus professor here at the university, and I uh, finished reading your book a short while ago, and uh, I can recommend it to everyone in the room. Right. Someone there didn't hear you. <laughs> Will that person please identify? Me? Well, uh, in any case, uh, I just returned from Israel a few days ago, as it happens, and you mentioned in your book the vibrancy in, in the country now in, in so many respects, and I haven't been in Israel for about maybe 10 years. I was struck by the, the construction every place, the new roads every place, the new skyscrapers in Tel Aviv, just really amazing in spite of, of everything. But the question I want to ask you is, in your book, you, you, you make almost no mention of uh, Sharon, who played such an important role, for better or for worse. And, and I'm wondering why you didn't, or if you have any comments uh, about that, about his role. Well, there, there are many Israelis that I, uh, I didn't mention in the book. Actually, most of the book, the, the, the logic of it is, <coughs> was to look for people who are significant in a way, but not the real leaders. You know, the book, you know, Ben Gurion is all over the place, but there isn't a chapter about Ben Gurion. And 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 so so it's it wasn't about you know the politicians. And I mean they are mentioned there, but it, I, I looked for the people who were like, if you wish, the majors and the colonels, not the generals. And in, 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 that was like the the, the, the logic of it. So people who were there in places that were so significant, but not really, you know, I didn't want to go into the, the his, you know, history of, of specific decision making. And, um, but if you want me to say a few words about Sharon, I'll say a few words about Sharon. I feel uh, I, I knew him pretty well. As I said, he, he enabled me to write the book, in a sense. Um, Look, I'll say, I'll say the following. Sharon, in my mind, what was so striking about Sharon was that on the one hand, he was a very Jewish Israeli, concrete to many Israeli-born suburbs. His identity always said, whenever I met him, he always said, I'm Jewish first. There was something, he had a 
very strong sense of Jewish history, this commitment to the Jewish people. He was, although he was like the ultimate Sabra, he was actually, he felt his, his Jewish identity was very strong. But when I looked at him, I actually saw in him someone who is in many ways the least Jewish person you can imagine. Because there was something about Sharon, he always, whenever I came out of a meeting with him, I, I, I could imagine him in the, as a kind of Russian farmer in the Napoleonic Wars, <laughs> who, who is going out to protect his uh, forest or something, because, you know, these, these horrible French people came and burned the woods. There was a deep, he was as far, why was not, he was deeply rooted in the land. He was really a kind of farmer warrior. He was, he had no Jewish neurotics, no, he was not mobile, he was not urban, he was not sophisticated, he was no intellectual. He liked to brag about his taste in music. But, he, again, when you met him, what was so striking that you realized that there was some sort of genius in him but you never ran into it. I mean, it wasn't, when you come up with meetings with other Israeli leaders, even problematic ones, you, are, you come up with ideas, with Sharon, you know, it, he was never, he was not brilliant intellectually. His strength was a kind of, he was a great tactician, he had an amazing sense of terrain, he had amazing sense for people, he knew immediately what's your weakness, and he knew how to take you out of balance. Uh, and he had the combination, he could have been very cruel, not only in his military, he was, there was an element in him that was, he could be really vicious to people, and yet he was charming like no other. I mean, the combination of this. So, at the end, you know, the way I see it, here is a guy, and if, I, if there would have been, and I, I was thinking of having a Sharon chapter because I had it ready, you know, with the New Yorker piece, and, had, there, had, had I taken him as a figure in my book, I would have said he's the person we clung to when tragedy struck. Because if, the, if things were okay, Sharon would not have been around. But when we were terrified, we needed someone as brutal and sophisticated in warfare as him to save us. So, in many ways, he helped saving us in the 50s when he changed the ethos of the IDF. And then definitely in 73 with the crossing of the Suez Canal. But on the other hand, because he did not have enough systematic, deep strategic thinking, he created these two terrible mistakes of the Lebanon War and the settlements. So it's true that at the end of his life he tried to mend one of them, but we are still left with, with what he left behind, which is, in my mind, Israel's greatest mistake. So although, like other journalists and people from the left and left center, I've learned you know, to like him and to appreciate him, and, and, and I do think that his collapse is, is, was catastrophic, because I think that had he remained with us, good things would have happened regarding occupation and regarding the Israeli political system. And yet, the record is a very, very mixed record. So that's the concise Sharon for you. I want to ask your students. Go ahead, uh, Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, you. No, no. Students, students, students first, then, then faculty. Um, my name's Harrison Lee. I am a student in Professor Perry's class. Um, almost completely ignorant on Israeli politics, so. Excuse me if I... Not at the end of the question. semester. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, but you said that, you made it interesting though, that you said that America has a sort of lack of cynicism. Um, but I guess during my generation, the funny thing is, is I've seen nothing but kind of a cynical attitude um, to the point where at one point, even I was, you know, everyone says it's your civic duty to vote. And it's, it's really important that you participate in American politics. But there was a time when I wasn't convinced of that. You know, politicians seemingly, you change names, you change faces, change ideologies, and nothing changes, you know, at the core root of it. Um, so for you, what is the, the root change in cynicism, the idea shift that's going to change the Israeli government 
um, in the political system there? Uh, so f first of all, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the I mean, you, you're probably right in your complaint about about American a degree of American citizens, but that's because I mean, you haven't seen Israel yet, <laughs> and 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 uh, and uh, I mean, you walk into an American room and, and there is a kind of, in a sense, goodwill. I mean, you're given a chance. I mean, once you, you fail, once you, you blow it, no mercy. You people are very, very brutal there. But you walk into the Israeli room and, uh, and they don't give you a chance. I mean, the, the assumption is that something is wrong with you unless you prove otherwise. So, so that's a kind of different, uh, 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 striking feature of, of, uh, of you know, America tends to give you a chance, but then it's very tough, and Israel tends not to give you a chance, and then it's very tough. <laughs> so, so uh, I actually think there is hope with the younger generation. Perhaps it's my wishful thinking, but I have a chapter in the book about the social protest in 2011 in Israel, and that movement, not that it was ideal, but that gave me a new sense of pride and hope. Because I think that of all the world's social network to social protest movements that we've seen, especially that year and a year later, Israel's was by far the most impressive. It was a wide movement. It wasn't just the fringe. It wasn't Occupy Wall Street. There was no violence. It was civilized. It was reasonable. It had a sense of humor. It was great. And suddenly, something erupted out of Israeli civic society that was very promising. I still think the promise is there. I think that the political manifestation of that movement in the last elections was somewhat less than satisfactory. But I think that something deep has changed in the mindset, and I think we've not seen the end of that process. So actually, I do, and, and, and in many ways, that protest was about counter cynicism. It was actually bringing a kind of hope back. And, and again, ironically, it's, it was the protest against the state that re-engaged many young people in public affairs and in the state. And I, I think that the people, the generation, I would say the 40 to 70 year olds in Israel, in many ways blew it. They, we, we did not do what we should have done. And I have some hope that the people under 30 in Israel will be different, and they will actually bring the change we need. Thank you. Yes, Michael. Uh, yes, uh, Michael Street, I'm a research professor. I'm also affiliated with uh, the Institute. You know, you talked about how uh, you brought up some subjects uh, you've talked about how you brought up some subjects that in Israeli society haven't really been talked about. Uh, and, and, and of course, the, the book also, by uh, talking about issues surrounding 1948, uh, has perhaps upset some people in the uh, Jewish community here. Uh, how, uh, has the book, uh, how has the book been received in, you know, not just in, in the media, but amongst the people that you've talked to? and? Where? In, in, in both Israel and here in the United States. So, so first of all, in Israel, it wasn't received yet because the book is not in Hebrew okay. yet. And people ask me about it, so if there is a question about it, let me get over that one. The reason the book is not out in Hebrew is that it, I was commissioned to write it by Random House, and Random House like the books in English. <laughs> so I made a point of writing it simultaneously in Hebrew, but I did the editing on the English, and the Hebrew is still in a kind of raw state. And I, I need a quite month to edit it, and so far I did not have a quite month, and I doubt it if I will have a quite month in the coming months. So we'll, we'll wait a bit, but then it will be in Hebrew. It remains to be, seen, to be seen whether the Chinese will be before the Hebrew or after the Hebrew. <laughs> but talking about this issue, the 48 issue, my guess, I mean, first of all, I, I, was, I would say I, definitely I was surprised by the kind of support I got in this country, and this is something to be discussed in, in perhaps if there will be questions about it. You know. 
Regarding 48, my guess is that the people who have more difficulty with this in Israel are the older laborites, actually. I think that the, there is an interesting phenomenon where the people on the left and the people on the right actually always saw the Palestinians more than the people in the center. Why? Because the people on the right, like the Jabotinsky people with this, they, they, were not, they could see the tragedy before it actually erupted. They could see the clash between two national movements. They were not shocked by the brutality, and, they, and they were, there, was a, there, there was cruelty and the ability to deal with the cruel reality in their, in their ideology. The people on the left, like many of my, my like the son of my great-grandfather, my great-uncle, was one of the founders of Brit Shalom, the first uh, uh, peace movement, and many of others, they saw the Palestinians because and they thought it can be solved. But the people in the center actually had a kind of, this kind of, from their point of view, kind of constructive uh, blindness, because they were facing a terrible clash between their values and the reality. So they had the need to be blind to begin with. It's still relevant today because they are the ones who still have, they are the ones who come tell me, no, no, really that didn't quite happen, it wasn't quite that. Actually, you know, it, they shot at us from that machine gun. And you know, it, They still have difficulty looking at it as it is. While the people on the right have less difficulty because they're used to they accept the brutal, the brutality of reality. The people on the left have no problem with it because this helps Israel, you know, taint Israel. And I think many young people, actually, you know, the taboo was in many ways bro broken in the late 80s. I think Benny Morris and others contributed a lot to that. So young people, even if they're not real scholars, they heard about it, they don't know, I mean, perhaps when they read my book they'd be a bit shocked by the the plastic descriptions, but it, it's not totally uh, impossible for them to grasp it. I think I'll be criticized, and I'll have a text from you know older laborites who have a real difficult. This is to this day they cannot acknowledge. It's very very difficult for them to deal with this sensitive issue. And what about American Jews? What's your reaction? What, what sort of reactions did you receive here? Look, I think that something quite interesting happened that, again, which of course I didn't plan, uh, that because, because I dealt with Israel's darker side in such a painful way, many, you know, Israel doesn't have a problem with the right. Not the Jewish right, not the non-Jewish right. Israel has a problem with progressive America and the progressive American Jewry. And I think that many progressive Jews and non-Jews who for a very long time were totally desperate about Israel actually, in this sense, clung to me or endorsed me because I, like, proved for them my progressive credentials by writing Lida and, and the other chapters. There is no doubt about where I stand morally, where my values are. And yet, I love Israel so much. And I think it's a long time. It's a long time. One of the problems Israel has is that people who fight for Israel do not speak the language of human rights and liberalism. And the people who speak the language of human rights and liberalism even if they are committed Zionists, they for a long time s s lost the passion to fight for Israel. And in this sense, perhaps I'm a bit, you know, bizarre and strange. And, and, and I think people like that. I mean, the fact that I'm, in, in, in this sense, ironically, actually, my chapter about Lida, which many people on the extreme right thought was heresy, and actually helped me promote Israel love among many people who, who've lost the ability to love Israel before. So, so it was a, it's a very, it was a interesting, and now, of course, nothing, nothing planned. I could not foresee any of this. this you know, I, I really wrote the book. I, I, I could not, there, there was nothing of all this that I could uh, foresee before. Well said. Yes, please. Oh, 
O.W. Greenberg Professor of Physics here. If the birth rate of Palestinians is greater than that of Jews, which I think is the case, how will the Jewish state survive when Jews are, are a minority inside Israel? Two points on that. One, this is why we must end occupation. I mean, I think we should end occupation because of, first of all, because of moral reasons, two, because of political reasons. But there is definitely the demographic argument, which is there. You cannot have a Jewish democratic state if you do not have an overwhelming Jewish majority. And if we remain in control of the West Bank, we will not have an overwhelming Jewish majority. I don't know if we'll have a Jewish majority at all, but definitely not an overwhelming one. So this is the strong argument for those people who don't have moral issues, do not understand the moral problem of occupation. But let me tell you that regarding to what you say, something is changing, which is very interesting. There is a dramatic drop in the growth rate of Palestinians generally, and, and many of our Arab neighbors as well, while there is stunning growth of Jewish birth. As I said, we, we mean not only Palestinians within Israel or ultra-Orthodox, even secular Israelis make a lot of babies. We are crazy about this. And, and therefore, if we deal, because in the past the argument used to be, no, even if you give up the territories, you know the demographics within Israel will, will, will jeopardize the Jewish majority. This is not the case anymore, because there is a, a dramatic drop in, 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 in the rate of, of non-Jews, of the birth rate, and there is a growth among the Jews. So it's not enough in order to, to I, don't, I don't think it enables us, and definitely there's no justification for maintaining occupation, but it gives you some reasons to believe that there could be a, 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 a long-term Jewish majority within post-occupation Israel. Paul? Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I'm Paul Shem. I teach Israel studies here. On the subject of the response to your book, the as you've probably seen, you've certainly not made yourself any friends on the right here. People are attacking even the institutions that host you. Uh, for uh, what you say. But I'd like to focus on a uh, point that you uh, didn't uh, talk about, but you, uh, it struck me in the yearbook. You are passionately against the occupation. You argue very strongly that Israel, as you just said, has to leave the uh, territories. But you assure the reader that won't bring peace. And usually those are combined. I'd like to know why you feel so certain of uh, that and why you feel that uh, Palestinians aren't uh, capable of uh, longing for uh, Palestine and uh, accepting the fact that they uh, never will have most of uh, it. Um, let me give you a softer version of my um, position. As you know, there is a peace process being uh, uh, pursued now, and I deeply support it. I have some doubts whether it succeed, but I want to support it, and I, in every week in the last months, I think, I've, I've been boring my readers by supporting it all the time. Uh, so I think, I, I can answer your question, but let me answer with what I, what, where, where my, here talking of, of, of prognosis, where my political position, I think it's in the sense. I think that we should not get into the theological debate 
Is it possible? Is it not possible? I might be right, I might be wrong. It's Israel's moral and political duty to reach out and to try to have peace with the Palestinians and to pay very high prices for them. So if I were Israel's prime minister, what I would do is I would take the Olmert plan or the Barak plan or the Clinton parameters you choose, I will give it to Yossi Balin, who is the peacenik, and I'll say, dear Yossi, you have six months, go get me this signed. If he comes back in six months and this is signed, I'm there, I'm all for it. But I would not waste a moment waiting for this to happen. So during these six months, I'd prepare plan B. And plan B would be, if there isn't a peace accord, let's try to end occupation, and that means it cannot be done overnight, it cannot, be gone, it cannot include going back to the 67 lines, but let's deal with occupation in a kind of sophisticated, coordinated, unilateral approach created, not to repeat the mistakes of Gaza, but have a new kind of approach. And in my mind, what we've been stuck is for 15 years now, is with this cycle where we expect peace every year next April, and we have 30,000 more settlers by next November. So let's stop that. And, and if peace can be reached, great. I'll be its greatest supporter. But if not so, let's plan a Plan B that will deal with occupation, again, in a creative, smart, cautious way, even if there is no peace. So my prayer is that in some State Department basement there is now a secret team preparing Plan B. Because if, God forbid, Secretary Kerry's initiative will fail and there will not be a Plan B, the ramifications will be very serious, if not dramatic. So, I'm all for plan A if possible, but if not so, let's have plan B ready. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have time for just one more question. Please. My name is Herbert Grossman. I'm a retired judge. Uh, two points here. One, you talk about a demographic problem with not entering into an agreement uh, with the Palestinians. But no one in their right mind in the Israeli government is considering taking back Gaza or Area A and parts of Area B that's been given away. We're only talking about the other areas in the West Bank, Area C and parts of Area B, in which there are hardly any Palestinians. So there really isn't any demographic problem there. Uh, the second thing is you keep talking about occupation. Now, I don't want to get into a discussion, because we don't have time, as to whether Israel's presence in the West Bank can be an occupation, considering that it's part of the mandatory uh, a territory. But as a physical matter, where is the occupation? The Arabs in the West Bank and in Gaza run themselves. They have their own governments. They have their own politics, their own economy. The only thing that Israel does is it goes in every two weeks and takes out people who are involved in a terrorist plot. Now, are you suggesting that Israel give up that right? Or what, what is it that constitutes an occupation other than that particular right? Thank you. Because I, I have a sense of where you stand ideologically. <laughs> I want, no, no, I, 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 I respect everybody and I, certainly I'm, I'm, I have no problem with that. Uh, I, I want to go further than your question is try to give you, try to convince you why there, perhaps there is some logic in what I represent, even according to your premises. On merit, I believe that there is a problem with the fact that there is a people, and I said the Palestinian people were not there as a fully defined people 100 years ago, but they are now. 
There is a problem with the people that is there that does not, cannot define itself politically and does not have a state expressing its national existence. And there isn't that state. So there is a need beyond the demography. There is a need in order to end this, to, to move forward, to end this, this unnormalic situation. You need to create, to give them a state. And if there is no, even if it's not a two-state solution, as I hinted before, I think it's in Israel's need to have a two-state state. Because if we will not have a two-state state, the result will be the one-state solution will be disastrous to us, it will be disastrous to Zionism. Now let me move a bit forward. In my mind, the greatest danger facing Israel today it's, is legitimacy problem. You can complain, and perhaps you're right, you can say the world is hypocritical. Why do they allow China to do what they do in Tibet and they don't allow, allow us to do what we do in Jenin? Why do they allow Russia to behave in the way they do and they don't allow us? But this is the world. We are a small nation whose existence is almost miraculous. There are many people around the world who are not that crazy about us. We have to realize that. We are no China, not Russia, we are not even the United States. We are a small, fragile country, nation surrounded by enemies that needs the support of the West. We will not be able to survive a moment without the support of the West. So even if on merit you are totally right, say your argument is totally right, you have to acknowledge, that was the wisdom of Zionism, to acknowledge the world as it is. The world today will not accept our policies. The world is fed up with this. So even if the world is wrong, if the world is hypocritical, we have to address this. Israel today does not have a military, a serious military problem with its neighbors. It's so strong. We do not have an F-15 problem. The problem we have is that if we go on doing what we do, our F-15s will not be able to take off to protect our existence when our existence need to be protected. We will not be able to, to activate our force because we are so tainted by settlements and occupation. So even if you think there is no occupation, we have every right and the biblicized rights and all that, look at the world as it, sees, as it is. The greatest front now is the front here. If we don't win hearts and open minds in progressive America and in Europe, with all the hypocrisies and with all the problems, we endanger ourselves and we might bring a catastrophe about the Zionist movement and the Zionist enterprise, which I so love and I'm so committed to. So don't see this as a kind of lefty, bleeding heart, liberal, naive, or dangerous or treacherous approach. On the contrary, in my mind, for our national future, for the future of the Jewish people, and even for our national security, we must deal immediately in a dramatic way with the challenge of legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank Samantha Levine for helping us organizing that. And thank you, Ari, for an excellent performance. And we invite you, and we invite you, we, we invite you. Two years is enough to write a new book? Hopefully. All right, in two years, we'll meet again here. Thank you. Hey, I think uh, it's, a, it's a great.